It's our custom to stand and read the Word of God together. I'll read a verse and you respond with the next. And let's stand together please and we'll read from Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 through 18. And the subject this morning is a reputation of the 1641 John Smith hoax on Baptist origins. Or how did the gospel come to Britain and Wales? Reading from Matthew 16, 13, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, He asked His disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? He saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood, that means men, hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. The Bible says in 1 Peter 3.15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Be ready always to give an answer or the reason for the hope that you have. So this morning I want to give a reason why I believe Baptists have existed since the days of Christ and the Apostles. In verse 18, which we just read, we have Jesus' promise of perpetuity to His church. He says in verse 18, And I say unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock, he's speaking of himself, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now that verse is all I need to know that God's church is still in the world today. Because he promised that the gates of hell Death will never prevail against His church. <clears throat> now our subject is, were there Baptists in England before 1641? Now the, the Protestant world is so anxious to disprove our Baptist claim of perpetuity that they come up with all ingenious kinds of reasons why we didn't exist in those long periods of ages. Even though we carried other names because of the localities in which we existed and some of the leaders that we had, we carried other names. And I shall prove to you this morning that before 1641, Baptists did exist. Now the Protestants believe and they preach this over and over again that there were no Baptists in England before 1641. And they say that the Baptists began in 1641 in England with a man named John Smith. Now that's their argument against us. And about 25 years ago, Excuse me. A group of Baptists asked me if I would come and address them on this subject. Did Baptists exist in England before 1641? And I prepared this message and I went and preached it to them. And I preached 
it several times since then, and I will preach it this morning. I have not changed anything in the message because truth does not change. It remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now the Protestant world believes that there were no Baptists in England before 1641. That's the whole argument against the perpetuity of the Baptist people. But I want to use a couple of illustrations this morning to show you that although throughout history we did not carry the name Baptist, we were Baptists. I have in my hand a picture of a horse. Everybody agree that's a picture of a horse? Not an alligator. It's not a snake. It's a horse. But I'm going to do one other thing here. You see that big word horse written under there? That identifies it as a horse. Now I'm going to do something here. I'm going to remove the name. Is it still a horse? Did it change into an alligator? Did it change into a python or a bird? It's still a horse, isn't it? Do I have to put this name on it to make it a horse? It's a horse anyway. It's a horse without a name, isn't it? Their argument is that because you weren't called Baptist, there weren't any Baptists. That's like saying because there, a horse didn't have a name, it wasn't a horse. I would refer you to Genesis chapter 2, verse 19 and 20. And show you here that God created the animals before He created Adam. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what He would name them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. If a horse galloped by, God said, Adam, what are you going to name that four-legged animal? Adam says, horse. From then on, it's going to be horse. Now, I know Adam didn't speak English, but nevertheless, I'm making an illustration. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. All the animals got their names from Adam. He named them all. And Adam gave names to all cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and every beast of the field. Now these animals all existed as animals without names until God called Adam to name them. Now according to the Protestants argument, there weren't any animals because they didn't have names until Adam named them. So there weren't any animals. You see my point? Just because we weren't always called Baptists doesn't mean we didn't exist as Baptists. It's not the name that makes us what we are. It's the doctrine that we believe from the Scriptures. That's what makes us Baptists. Another illustration. How do you know it's a horse? You know it's a horse by certain identifying marks. It has hooves. It has a mane. It has a tail. And it has pointed ears and a long face. Everybody knows a horse by its identifying marks. And you can identify the Lord's church by its identifying marks. The Lord's church has certain identifying marks. Salvation by grace. No infant baptism. The divine trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Baptism for believers only. Closed communion. Restricted to the congregation. And on and on we can go with the identifying marks 
from the New Testament which testify which of the churches existing in the world today is the Lord's church. All historians of repute, all honest historians will state and have stated in print that the Baptists are the original Christians and existed from the days of Christ and the Apostles. I don't have this time this morning, but I've given it to you previously. All of the reputable historians of church history agree Baptists are the original Christians. They never changed anywhere along the way. They continued believing the same doctrines. Give you another example. I was reading the other night in Acts 27 about Paul's shipwreck. How the ship was in a storm and the waves were lapping over the huge boat and the planks were creaking and breaking up. The ship was about to go down and the ocean was roiling. And the Bible says that Paul and his companions leaped into the sea and swam to shore. And as I looked that chapter over real carefully, I didn't find the word water. The word water is not in that chapter. So I have to conclude as a Protestant that they swam in, was it milk? Maybe they swam in grape juice. What did they swim in? Well, you say they swam in water. Uh, but that won't do because the word water is not in that chapter. So you can't call it water. Now that's Protestant thinking. If you ask the Baptist that same question, he'll say they swam in water. And my Protestant brother will say, well, how are you going to prove they swam in water? Well, common sense will tell you there wasn't anything else to swim in. Did you know the word Trinity is not printed anywhere in your Bible? Now, the doctrine of the Trinity is everywhere in the Bible. But the word Trinity is not found in the Bible. Does that mean there's no Trinity because the word is not found there? Of course not. I preach on the Trinity almost every Sunday. Because if you don't believe in a triune God, you're not saved. The Father in heaven and the Son standing in the Jordan River baptized by John the Baptist and the Spirit of God speaking and coming down in the form of a dove. There you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There you have the triune God. All three persons of the Trinity present at the baptism of Jesus. But the word Trinity is not found. So according to the Protestant rationale, there couldn't be any Trinity because the word Trinity is not spelled out in the Bible. You see how foolish the argument is. And you see how easy it is to prove our antiquity back to the days of Christ and the apostles without the name Baptist. But I would remind you also that the name Baptist is found 14 times in the New Testament. 14 times you find the word Baptist. And where did the word Baptist come from? The Bible says all Scripture is given by divine inspiration. Every word of the New Testament was written by divine inspiration. It came from the mouth of God. Paul didn't write Romans. God wrote Romans. James didn't write the book of James. God wrote the book of James. And he used them as amanuensis. He used them as stenographers. He gave them the word and they wrote it down. But what they wrote down, they admitted they didn't always understand. Every word of the New Testament is written by divine inspiration. The word grace is not found in Matthew or Mark, but grace is everywhere in those books, though the word is not there. So we don't make a big thing about not having the word as a label. 
We know who we are. We know what we believe. And we know where we got our belief. We got it from the Word of God. We got it from history. And we know that history will stand the test. Now they betray their lack of knowledge not only of the Bible but also of history. The name Baptist was given to the Apostle John, given to John 2,000 years ago as a name. His name is John the Baptist. Not John the Lutheran. He's not John the Presbyterian. He's not John the this, John the that. His name is John the Baptist. The is in the Greek article. He is the Baptist. He is the first Baptist that ever existed. You say, how did he get into the church? How did Adam get here? When God wanted to make a man, he just made him. Adam. And when God wanted to make a Baptist, he just made him. John the Baptist. And named him John the Baptist. And that name Baptist is of divine origin. It came from God. If you believe every word of the New Testament is the word of God, you have to believe the word Baptist is the word of God also. Am I wrong here somewhere? I'm just trying to use a little logic this morning. Think about it. Now they say that a man by the name of John Smith started the Baptist in England in 1641. And they say before that time there were no Baptists. Now my task this morning is to deal with this argument and to show you that it is a pseudo-false argument concocted by Protestants who are opposed to the Baptists. Let me read you something. John Smith was ordained in the Church of England. He was a preacher in the Church of England. And he was dissatisfied with his baptism, so he left the Church of England and moved to Holland. And there, history says that Probably, he there practiced sea baptism. Now, what is sea baptism? It is self-baptism. In this day of taking selfies of, of people, we know what selfies are. Sea baptism means he baptized himself. He stood in a tub of water, got some water in a, in a dipper, and he poured it over his head and said, I've been baptized. Now, there were Dutch Baptists there in Holland that he could have gone to, but he didn't go to them because he was prejudiced against the Baptists. So the Dutch Baptists didn't have anything to do with him. And then he came back to England and he started a church. And he poured water over his head and called it baptism. And they have taken that historical act of John Smith, who was never a Baptist, who practiced self-baptism according to much of the historical scholars and proclaimed himself a separatist. And that's where the English separatist theory of Baptists came from. The Baptists would not take him. I'll read something quickly to you. John Smith did not found the tenets of the Baptist religion in Amsterdam in 1607 or 1641 as some say. He was an Armenian Sea Baptist who founded a separatist church, one the Baptist church. Many of his teachings were foreign to the New Testament and to the cherished beliefs of Baptists today. Thomas Crosby, an early Baptist historian in the 1700s, long ago refuted this claim about John Smith. He wrote, if he, John Smith, were guilty of what they charge him with, it is no blemish on English Baptists who neither approved of any such method nor did they receive their baptism from him. That's uh, Thomas Crosby, History of the English Baptist, Volume 1, page 99. Dr. Smith, editor of The Standard at Chicago, and formerly a lecturer on church history to the Chicago Baptist Theological Seminary says, and I quote, as we 
have said on former occasions, John Smith is not counted on as one of the founders of the Baptist denomination. Another historian. Well did Hercules Collins, a Baptist minister of Wapping, England, in a work published in 1691, say of the English Baptists as to having received their baptism from John Smith, it is absolutely untrue. It being well known to some who are yet alive, this how false this assertion is. And if J.W. will but give a meeting with any of us and bring whom he pleases with him, we shall sufficiently show the falsity of what is asserted by him in this matter and in many other things which he unchristianly asserted. Ivamy's History of the English Baptist, Volume 1, page 140. I don't concoct all this up in my head. I'm quoting historians, honorable men, who, even though many of them were not Baptists, affirm this truth. Now, I want to show you this morning that there were 11 Baptist churches operating in England before 1641. And there goes their whole argument. If I can prove that there was one Baptist church before 1641, I win. If, if I cannot find a Baptist church before 1641, I lose. Now, either I lose or they lose. Can't both be right. They make the flat statement, and you can get it on the internet. They're all Protestants or Catholics. You can get it on the internet. And they'll tell you the same thing. Baptists started with John Smith in 1641. Well, you say, internet can't be wrong. Oh, I could point out many wrong things on the internet to you. So I'm not going to give you one Baptist church before 1641. I'm going to give you 11. And you'll excuse me for reading so much, but I want to give you authoritative history written by historians, not my ideas. The English separatist descent theory is a theory that the origin of the Baptist should be dated from 1641 when immersion was renewed in England by a few English separatists who came out of the Jacob Church of Southwark, London, having been convinced that the biblical practice was dipping underwater. Now, church number one, there is much more evidence to prove that Baptists did not start in 1607 or 41 with John Smith. First, there is a Baptist church, Hillcliff, in England, whose existence goes back to 1357. 1357, not 1641. See the history of the Baptist church at Hillcliff by James Kenworthy. Number two, the earliest evidence of the existence of the Hillcliff church is found on a stone in a burial ground and bearing the date 1357. Another stone was found with the date 1414. This is a long time before 1641, over 200 years or three. Another has the date 1523 and another has the date 1599. But the dates of the greater portion of the old stones are lost. It has often been said that the Hillcliff people during the persecutions in the reign of Bloody Mary, the Bloody Queen of England, the members of Hillcliff Church suffered with their fellow Christians in other parts of the kingdom. So there is the Hillcliff Church. Number three, the church in Hop Garden. Second, there is the Longworth Coat Baptist Church which dates its beginning from 1481. See the church in Hop Garden by John Stanley. This church is near Oxford and is often called the Church of Hop Garden. Number four, there is the Crowell Baptist Church of East Midland, which started in 1599, which is 42 years before 1641. In the fifth place, there is the Epworth Baptist Church in the same section, which started in 1599, 
which is 42 years before 1641. Sixthly, there is the Bain Tree Baptist Church in this same general section which dates its origin from 1550, which is 91 years before 1641. Sixthly, in Kent, there is the Ethorn, which had its origin in 1550, which is 91 years before 1641. All of these English Baptist churches commenced prior to 1641. And I think the English Baptists ought to know their own history. The eighth church is called the church at Crowell in Lincolnshire, a few miles from Gainsborough. There, according to an old church book, recently copied a Baptist society as early as 1550. The ninth, there were several Anabaptist conventicles in London and other places in 1589. That's 52 years before 1641. A congregation, number 10, of Baptists was discovered on Easter Day at Aldergate, London in 1570, 27 of which were taken and imprisoned. Now here's Baptists in 1570 being put in prison because they were Baptists. 27 arrested and imprisoned where they wasted and died in filthy dungeons. During the same year, John Wildmaker and Henry Tour were burned at Smithfield. Now this congregation of Baptists, which were arrested for worshiping the Lord, existed 71 years before 1641. And it says a congregation of Baptists were arrested. John Bouquer of Kent, England, a female of illustrious character and family distinction. Her education was far beyond that of most of her countrymen. The commission was granted to the bishops to search out and apprehend the heretical Baptists. They call us heretical. They still do. Joan was selected as an illustrious victim. Now this Baptist woman was tried before these Protestant bishops and condemned to die. A year within three days transpired between her condemnation and death. Every effort was made to pervert her from the truth. At length, on the 2nd of May, 1550, she was bound to the stake in Smithfield because she would not recant her Baptist faith. And she died in fearless triumph. Her persecutors tried to sully her memory by attributing opinions to her which she never held. She was a Baptist, a member of the Baptist Church existing at Canterbury, at which exists to this very hour. She was burned at the stake because she would not recant her Baptist faith in the Word of God. Her memory is deathless. The crime of her murder stains with blackness and stamps falsehood on the front of episcopacy. Now there are at least 11 churches that I have identified historically by historians that existed before 1641. Some of them 300 years before. So the argument of the Protestant church historians and preachers that there was no Baptist church before John Smith in 1641 is refuted by the historical evidence that exists. You can't do away with history. George Washington was the first president of the United States. You can't change that. You say, I don't like George Washington. Doesn't matter. You can't change history. I have been accused of rewriting history. I'm not rewriting history. I'm calling your attention to it. I didn't write these things. Historians of repute wrote these things. I'm only bringing them to your attention. Anabaptists 
were martyred in 1535. We read of no persecution or abjuration to have been in the Church of England except that of the registers of London. These are official records. The registers of London make certain mention of certain Anabaptists to whom ten were put to death in sundry places in the realm in A.D. 1535, the other ten repented and were saved. Ten stood by their faith, ten repented and were allowed to go free. The ten that stood their ground became martyrs for the truth and died at the stake. I could go on and on and on, but time will not permit. I have so much more historical, irrefutable evidence. But I won't weary you with, with that much more. Except to say that in 1535, the supreme head of the Church of England issued two edicts against, who do you suppose they were against? The Anabaptists. This is the records of the Church of England. They issued two edicts against the Anabaptists. Now how can you issue edicts against Anabaptists if there were no Anabaptists? This is in the official records of the Church of England. In 1530, an assembly of bishops and other theologians convened by Archbishop Warheim at the command of King Henry VIII condemned an Anabaptist book entitled The Sum of Scripture. How do you condemn an Anabaptist book 111 years before it was written? I must hurry along with uh, Mr. Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon, London's great preacher, probably the greatest preacher that ever preached. This is what he said. We believe the Baptists are the original Christians. We did not commence our existence at the Reformation. We were reformers before Luther or Calvin were born. We never came from the Church of Rome, for we were never in it. But we have an unbroken line up to the apostles themselves. We have always existed from the very days of Christ. And our principles, sometimes veiled and forgotten, like a river which may travel underground for a little season, have always had honest and holy adherents, persecuted alike by Romanists and Protestants of almost every sect. Yet there has never existed a government holding Baptist principles which persecuted others. Nor, I believe, any body of Baptists ever held it to be right to put the consciences of others under the control of man. We have ever been ready to suffer, as our martyrologies will prove, but we are not ready to accept any help from the state, nor to prostitute the purity of the bride of Christ to any alliance with government, and we will never make the church, although the queen, the despot over the consciences of men. The right of private judgment is the crown jewel of the Baptist people. Every Christian has a right to read the Bible and to interpret it for himself. He does not have to go to a bishop. He does not have to go to a pope. He does not have to go to a priest. He can open his Bible and read it for himself. That's the crown jewel of the Baptist faith. That every man is free to interpret and read the Bible for himself. I'm going to skip a lot more of my evidence because the clock is telling me to, to get going. Now I want to come to the question. How did the gospel ever get to Britain in the first place? I'm going to give you a surprise. If you were to open your Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 4, you would get a shock. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 21. Well, I'll start with verse 19. 2 Timothy 4, 19. 
This is vitally important. Paul, Second Timothy 4, 19, 20 and 21. A lady by the name of Claudia is sending greetings to Timothy, who was a pastor in Ephesus. And this is Paul's epistle. But she is there with Paul. And she asks Paul in his epistle to Timothy to include greetings. Let me read this. Beginning with verse 19. Salute Prisca and Aquila and the household of Anisophorus. Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletum sick. Now look at verse 21. Do thy diligence to come before winter, Paul says. And here's where Claudia asks that he give a greeting to Timothy. Ebulus greeteth thee, and Pudens, circle that word Pudens, and Linus, circle that word Linus, and Claudia, circle that word Claudia, and all the brethren. Now you say, I don't see anything so important about that. Who would have ever dreamed that that little greeting right there would tell you how the gospel came to England? Now, I realize I have to put that together. But that is exactly what happened. This woman, Claudia, was a Brit or a whale, Welsh woman. There's some argument about which it is. And I've got to go back now into Roman history 2,000 years ago. There was a poet by the name of Marshall. And Marshall lived in Rome at the time Paul was imprisoned in Rome. You'll remember that he was allowed to live in his own house and to receive visitors even though he was imprisoned. He was allowed to live in his private house waiting for his trial. There was in Rome a lady named Claudia. She married a man named Pudens. And Claudia and Pudens were of the household of Caesar. They were, they were influential people. And they were allowed in the household of Caesar. And being in the household of Caesar, they heard about the Apostle Paul. And they went to visit the Apostle Paul to hear his gospel. They were won to Christ by the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul told them to go back home where they came from and take the gospel to England. And they did. Now, a lot of this is lost in the murkiness of 2,000 years of history and the loss of records. But the records that we do have validates what I'm telling you this morning. Marshall settled in A.D. 66. That was the year that Paul was in prison in Rome. That is the year that Claudia and Pudens got married and were in the household of Caesar and came to Paul and were converted. <clears throat> Shortly after that, Claudia with her husband Pudens, went back to Wales and took the gospel to Wales and to Britain. Matthew Henry, one of the most respected Bible commentators that ever wrote a commentary on the scripture, verifies this somewhat himself. Also other intelligent historians, such as John Gill, the famous Baptist of England, they all acknowledge this. Now when we check the dates, we find that the dates correspond with what Marshall wrote and also with Claudia being in there and with Paul's epistle where this is all stated. Putin's was a Roman knight. 
He married Claudia, who was a Brit or a Welsh woman. We're not sure which. Probably Welsh. And Marshall and his poems are still in existence. You can get them today. In fact, they're on the internet. Marshall, back in the year 66 A.D., and his poems have been preserved. This is what he wrote about Claudia. And I quote, A British lady in Rome, Claudia, the newly married wife of Putin's, now this is outside the Bible. This, this reference is by, by Marshall, the poet. It's outside the Bible. And yet we find this same Putin's and Claudia in the Bible. Of her, he says, in terms, as he believed, of the highest personal praise, through Claudia, from the sea green Britons came. She wears the aspect of a Roman dame. That's what Marshall wrote about Claudia. And his poems are still in existence today. See, so we're getting confirmations of history. Linus was the son of Claudia. And he was the first bishop in Rome. Now I'm going to read something to you. It's from a book called The Welsh Baptist by Davis, a historian. And he's commenting on 2 Timothy 4.21. And this is what he said, and I'm just going to read it in its entirety to you. About 50 years before the birth of our Savior, the Romans invaded the British Isles in the reign of the Welsh king Casabella. But having failed in consequence of other and more important wars, to conquer the Welsh nation, made peace with the Welsh, and dwelt among them many years. During that period, many of the Welsh soldiers joined the Roman army, and many families from Wales visited Rome, including Claudia, among whom there was a certain woman of the name of Claudia, who was married to a man named Putins. At the same time, Paul was sent a prisoner to Rome and preached there in his own hired house for the space of two years, about the year of our Lord 63. Putin's and Claudia, his wife, who belonged to Caesar's household under the blessing of God on Paul's preaching, were brought to the knowledge of the truth as it is in Jesus and made a profession of the Christian religion. These, together with other Welshmen among the Roman soldiers who had tasted that the Lord is gracious, exerted themselves on the behalf of their countrymen in Wales, who were at that time vile idolaters. The fact, those he used the word fact, the fact, we believe, is this. The Welsh lady, Claudia, and others who were converted under Paul's ministry in Rome, carried the precious seed with them and scattered it on the hills and the valleys of Wales. And since that time, many thousands have reaped the most glorious hearts. They told their countrymen around what a dear Savior they had found. They pointed to His redeeming blood as the only way whereby they might come to God. The Welsh can truly say, if by the transgression of a woman, sin came into the world, it was through the instrumentality of a woman, even painted Claudia, that the glorious news of the gospel reached their ears. And they felt it to be mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds of darkness. How rapidly did the mighty gospel of Christ fly abroad. The very year, 63 A.D., when Paul, a prisoner, was preaching to a few individuals in his own hired house in Rome, the seed sown there is growing in the Isle of Britain. We have nothing of importance to communicate respecting the Welsh Baptists from this period to the year 180. 
when two ministers by the names of Phaganus and Damacanus, who were born in Wales, but were born again in Rome, and there becoming intimate ministers of the gospel, were sent from Rome to assist their brethren in Wales. Claudia brought the gospel back to Wales. I believe she was a Welsh woman, although some believe she was a Brit. But nevertheless, Davis identifies her as a Welsh woman. She goes back with her husband, Thunes, after having been converted in Paul's house, goes back to Wales, takes the gospel to the people of Wales, and the gospel spread throughout Wales. Our Baptist people in America were the beneficiaries of Claudius going to Wales because our, our Baptist people came from the Baptists of Wales. That's in our Baptist history in America. We are products of the Welsh Baptists who are products of Claudia and Pudens bringing the gospel to Wales. Now, I've run out of time. I have to stop. But I would ask you to reflect on these things. If God established a church, and if he promised the gates of hell would never prevail against it, then that church has to be in the world today. And there are over 3,000 churches today, that is denominations, claiming to be the Lord's church. And you've got to pick out one of those 3,000 denominations and say, which one of these is the one that God preserved? And what would your choice be? There are 3,000 denominations in the world today. And, you, and since the church could not have passed off the scene because God's Word would have fallen to the ground if they had, that church is in the world today. Which one is it of the 3,000? Is it the Lutherans? Is it the Presbyterians? Is it the Church of Christ people? Is it the many, many cults like Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses? Which of the 3,000 can date their origin back to Christ and the Apostles by honest historians? Honest historians will tell you there's only one, and that's the Baptist people. And why is that? Because this book is where we take our doctrine. 100%. Now there are other churches that believe some of these things that we believe. But there are none except Baptists that believe 100% everything that we believe. And everything we believe is in the Bible. If you're not a Baptist, you ought to be. Being a Baptist won't get you to heaven. But I sure give you a wonderful fellowship along the way. I was not a Baptist when the Lord saved me. I had to find it the hard way. I visited church after church after church. And one day I visited a Baptist church. I was searching. And when that man preached, I knew where I was. I had found my brethren. I've been a Baptist for 62 years now. And I'll live and die a Baptist. I don't expect it to get me to heaven. But as I said, it's a wonderful companionship along the way with my Baptist brethren. But if you're not saved, the church is not what you need to look at. You need to look at Christ. Trust Him as your Savior who died for your sins on the cross of Calvary, shed His redeeming blood to keep you out of hell. And He'll do that for you if you trust Him. You say, what must I do to be saved? The Apostle Paul answered that question to a Philippian jailer when he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Let us stand together, please. <laughs> Sing our invitation verse, just one verse, as we sing, just as I am. If you're here today without Christ, we invite you to confess Him as your Savior today.
Believe on Him right where you stand and then confess Him publicly. If you're here without baptism or without church membership, why don't you come this morning and say, Preacher, I believe that the church you're talking about this morning is the right church and I want to be a part of it. As we sing, would you come? Just as I am